the first topic we're going to talk about <coughs> is the, um, the counterbalance uh, in retail brick and mortar. And a lot of folks say brick and mortar is dead. Well, uh, we don't think brick and mortar is going to go away. E-commerce is just uh, under 8% uh, of total uh, retail sales. Um, but the question for the group here, and I'm going to really uh, toss this over to Rakesh to get us started, um, is how much do you think about brick and mortar? Your businesses were born online. How much do you think about brick and mortar um, uh, and, and how it could ultimately impact your business? So I think brick and mortar is going to be around. I think, you, you know, uh, Mark Andreessen wrote a big piece on that. Either it was Mark or Ben wrote a big piece on that. Um, talking about the depth of uh, brick and mortar commerce. I think w we're seeing a big shift in the way uh, people shop. I think there's a big shift of people shopping online. Um, but I think the, on the brick and mortar front, people are moving much more sort of higher end. So you're seeing that shift in the malls. In, uh, you know, if you go to San Francisco, you'll see the American Eagles and the Panda Expresses moving out and more of the higher end stores, the Tiffany's, the Valentino's of the world, kind of moving in. And we saw that shift even uh, when I went to Australia uh, in Sydney at the South uh, Westfield Mall there as well. So, you know, I think we think of this as, you know, this competition is going to be around. It's going to be there for a long time. And we just have to find a way to differentiate ourselves for women to want to, um, you know, come to Latout rather than shop offline. So we're, we're going to have to come up with a value proposition, which we think we, we sort of have, and continue to offer that experience to women in a consistent manner going forward. So you know, I think online is going to have to embrace offline in some ways. Um, you know, we're, we're doing pop-up shops. We're doing we're trying to take advantage of uh, the fact that people do live in the offline world and you kind of have to be exposed because shopping is an emotional, uh, emotional experience for men as well as for women. Michelle, you're completely disrupting uh, an old style business. So how do you think about brick and mortar? It's kind of interesting. We're, we're a little divided about it inside our company. So you know, from one angle, we're actually replacing a really uncomfortable store experience, which is essentially this two and a half hours you spend in a fitting room as you're trying to find the bra that's right for you. And that's, that actually is a big, um, you know, a big push in our favor as an online-only company that we actually do replace that experience, that nobody looks at you, that you don't have to go to store, that nobody's intruding on your privacy. Um, so that's one aspect that has played well in our favor. And it also plays well to the value proposition of online in general, which is convenience, and then for the early adopters in the crowd, trying something new, which our customers have said are like major things that we do well. Um, you know, on the other hand, if you look at the primary value proposition of brick and mortar, you know, jumping onto your point, there's this art of storytelling that happens when you pass by a store that's beautifully arrayed and merchandised. Um, and you know, Victoria's Secret, you know, our primary competitor with 1,100 brick and mortar stores across the US, has that in spades. It's not about finding a great fitting bra at Victoria's Secret. It's about looking like that woman in the shop window, which we, we actually know is impossible, but we still like to dream. So it's that whole point about if you're an online player, can you deliver the convenience? Can you deliver this, try something new, because you're part of this new guard? But then at the same time, can you actually create this incredibly emotional storytelling experience when you don't have those chance encounters? that you would have in a mall. And you could argue social and a bunch of other things would give you those chance encounters. But you know, um, really thinking through that um, as an online only player is very important. Yeah, great. Next topic is, uh, is social. And you can't have a conversation about retail without talking about uh, social platforms. Um, and this, this question will live squarely in uh, Chris Bennett's uh, wheelhouse. Um, his company lives and dies uh, on Facebook. So the question is, um, how do you view social? How important is social? Uh, and how specifically are you leveraging social today to make a significant difference uh, in your business? So Chris, start us off um, on, on that one, please. Yeah, we're, we're obviously very excited about social. And we've placed the majority of our bets right now on Facebook. And a lot of the businesses we're working with are doing the same. So 
we're working with hundreds of businesses that are um, making you know, thousands up to tens, tens of thousands of dollars a week selling their products directly to consumers um, on Facebook. And what's interesting is they're thinking about social, as they're going to social first. They're not creating websites, they're not creating brick and mortar businesses. They're um, getting their friends and family to see their products on Facebook. They're going to uh, the market and buying stuff wholesale and selling directly to their community. And their communities are growing really fast and their businesses are growing really fast. And so we think it's just this really exciting opportunity. Um, and we're learning that the best aspect of social is it's the, I would say it's the two big things. One, um, customer acquisition costs are extremely low just because of the viral nature of um, all these social networks, in particular Facebook. And two, it's the most efficient way to manage a community. If you're able to get the majority of um, your, your, your shoppers to follow you on Facebook or Instagram um, or even Pinterest, you're able to engage with them just by posting photos and having people go to your page, buy from you by commenting sold, um, or if you're a brick and mortar business, come into your business and, and buy from you. And so we are heavily, heavily leveraged on social because it's just such a clear opportunity. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, the way I think about e-commerce, it's all about customer engagement uh, that leads to you know, customer acquisition at some point. So you know, e-commerce, I think, like every other business, it's all about brand building. And social gives you that element to engage with your customers on a very regular, consistent basis. So you may not be the store they see uh, every day when they walk to work, but you're in their feeds when they you know, spend two hours a day on Facebook or 15 minutes on Insta. So I think it's a really important piece of our business. Uh, our customers demand to see stuff on the social platforms. Um, and so we've started leveraging social media in a number of different ways. Um, you know, about 90% or 80% of our customers that we acquire, um, non, uh, I mean, this is all non-organic users. They all come from Facebook, and our customer acquisition costs are about half of what it is on other channels. So we think of you know, Facebook as a really great tool to not just engage with our customers and build our brand, but also a great way to acquire customers. Um, on, you know, on some of the other end, uh, which is Twitter, I think of that as a very different sort of social media tool, which, which is great to engage. And we think of it more as a customer service tool where we can really do damage control, where you know, we screwed up recently with our warehouse upgrades and we were about a week uh, behind on shipments. So we used Twitter as a way to reach out to our users, engage with them, and you know, apologize on a much more social and personal level rather than simply sending uh, emails or posting something on our website. So you know, and our users really appreciated that. So we, we consider uh, our commerce as becoming more and more social going forward given where the market's going. Um, Michelle, I mean, it's, you know, it, it, that's got to be a big part of, uh, of how you drive your business and expand it. Yeah, uh, on the one hand, a woman doesn't like to talk about what bras she bought yesterday. Um, so that's slightly different than some of the other categories that are much more publicly revealable. Um, at the same time, the brand building component, um, our brand is a sophisticated destination for the graduate of Victoria's Secret. It's a very powerful medium for us. Um, as a small company, though, you have to make trade-offs. So at the beginning, we were completely, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, Wanilo. There was a bunch of other platforms we should have focused on. And you know, similar to you, Facebook was the one that is generating the volume right now. Um, and so, you know, as a small company, we're pouring most of our resources to that and using Twitter as sort of more of a PA, you know, public announcement channel for us sure. for expert advice. I can imagine that women may not be talking about the specific products. But I bet they're talking a lot about the service and the model that, that you brought to bear. Uh, they definitely are. So the topics that happen when the guys are out of the room, <laughs> which is, you know, like what brought you by yesterday, that does happen, but it's in more trusted 
communication channels versus just blasting to a co-ed audience on Facebook. Sure. So we are definitely seeing a little bit of that. Yeah. What about you, Sander, in, in your community and service providers? Uh, what Michelle said rang true to us is a small business you have to make trade-offs. So uh, actually, we're, we're heavily reliant on Google. Um, still, we're like e-commerce v1 in that sense. Um, but we are starting to see social uh, take off as, as a, uh, we use it as a user acquisition channel. Um, but of course, when you use it as an ac user acquisition channel, people start commenting, so it draws you into the conversation element of it. It certainly seems like, uh, you know, five years ago, these social channels were a nice to have and okay if you participated. Um, but it's clearly, uh, clearly changing. It's become, uh, you know, a line item on the marketing budget. And, uh, it's you know. really hard work, though. Yeah. And I know Google and the other channels are also hard work too, but here you're doing, you're trying to treat it like a customer acquisition channel, but you have to create a bunch of content that's unique and engaging. And a lot of times the click-throughs, the direct click-throughs actually don't justify it. Like you really do have to look at the brand piece of it to say it's worth it for a small company to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds like consistency uh, is really important. Not something you can kind of jump in because you like it today and forget about it all uh, next yeah. week. Right? That's right. Exactly yeah. right. uh, next question is going to go uh, directly to, uh, to Sander, um, and this question is about trust. <coughs> um, trust, as everyone knows, is the foundation uh, of any brand. Building it, nurturing it, and maintaining it uh, are absolute imperatives. So with Thumbtack, consumers not only have to trust you, but they have to trust the service provider that you bring to us. So talk to us about trust, how you manage it, how you think about it, and ultimately how it impacts your business. Yeah, trust obviously is critically important in the local services industry. So um, when you bring somebody into your home or when you ride in a car with somebody, you have to trust them. How do you create that trust? Uh, generally, what you see happening today in the local services industry is a rush to commoditize local services so that you can package and sell them like uh, you would an e-commerce product. The only company that has really done this successfully at scale yet is Uber. But what you are going to see is uh, numerous companies being formed to tackle vertical after vertical after vertical. I think there was a pet sitting one that Andreessen recently funded. Um, there are some uh, task companies, some house cleaning companies. but. Uh, there is the local services industry generally is enormous, um, just as big of a part of the industry as e-commerce, but there are only one, two, three, four small vertical companies um, that exist today. And to create a vertical company uh, or any company that wins in the local service industry, you have to figure out a way uh, to make people trust you and trust um, the pros that are on the platform. Right now, the answer that everybody is converging on is a similar one that was converged on in the early days in eBay and Amazon, which is star ratings. Uh, you know, on Thumbtack, we have people who have uh, we have people who have committed misdeeds in their past. Um, but if somebody uh, had a DUI 15 years ago, does that really say much about how he is a plumber, how he does as a plumber today? Maybe not. So we can't really rely on criminal background checks, things like that, um, as much as you would think. So really, in our industry, um, like in the uh, e-commerce industries, it's, it's all about star ratings plus some minimal level of you know, criminal background check type things where we can, where we can uh, get access to that information. It's a tough, tough problem. Yeah. Um, clearly, it's important to, to all of these businesses here, but in, uh, in your business, it's, it's got a double-edged double, double edged, uh, impact. Um, Michelle, this question's for you. Um, some brands are, some online brands, are starting to enhance their presence with physical locations. A good example is uh, Warby Parker, uh, Bonobos. Um, why, why is that? These are brands that were born online. Why are they... Uh, doing what they're doing in the physical space? Well, I think you can make a provocative statement. I think it's only a matter of time 
but I think you can make a provocative statement that no one has built a purely digital or online brand in the apparel space yet, right? So Warby Parker is known to us, but you know we're all investors and early adopters, and we're way ahead of the rest of the U.S. population in terms of discovering brands. Um, and so I think it's very natural for the first generation of these online brands to say, you know, if e-commerce is only 8% of the pie and there's a majority of the U.S. population that will never click on a, a link or a, you know, display ad or whatnot saying Warby Parker that I got to go to where the people are. Um, so I think it makes a lot of sense for this first generation to look at brick and mortars, particularly as they're, they're trying to accelerate their growth um, through that middle period, like somewhere after 25 million in revenues, you start seeing, okay, maybe Google isn't as cheap a channel as we thought <laughs> now that we need to get to scale. And a cheaper thing is actually to do what people have done in the past before us and simply you know, compute the dollars per square foot and bite that bullet. Um, I do think it's, it's a lack of focus for any brand, uh, online brand before 25 million to think about brick and mortar because the competencies are so different. Um, I can safely say that we're under that threshold since we're a little over a year old right now. Um, and so for us, it's about you know, making sure, as I said before, that storytelling element that we can capture that in the online forum. And then potentially you know, looking and seeing at how this first generation of online brands do. You know, they're taking very different approaches. Some people are doing the guide shops on the second floor. Some people are doing that expensive flagship in Soho. Some people are doing a, you know, a wholesale relationship with a great department store retailer or a store within a store concept. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very excited to see which of these plays can minimize the distractions and the cost of brick and mortar while at the same time bringing the storytelling to a large swath of the U.S. population that will never, you know, that will never you know, automatically discover an online-only brand. Yeah. It may be also that um, the, 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 the rationale for having an online presence may not be to further, directly further commerce. Um, Rakesh, you were talking earlier about how you think about uh, having a retail presence and the value of that. So, absolutely. So, I think we're, we're on completely different uh, ends of the spectrum here. Uh, we think of uh, the offline experience as being almost as important as having the online experience. We think of shopping as an emotional uh, experience. We also think of it as a, you know, the emotional experience helps with the brand building. Um, so we think of, we, we have these parties, we have events, we, we've actually tied up with Bonobos uh, to do events with them. And we think of that as a really great way to build uh, buzz, create, build our brand and create awareness but also have people you know, touch and feel and start to trust you. I think it's really, really important for a customer to know, you know who you are as a company by meeting maybe people from the company. I, I think it's also important for them to touch and feel the clothes, accessories in our case. Um, and you know, that sort of helps build that trust. And we've seen that uh, convert really, really well for us. Um, you, you know, customers that are sort of on the cusp of should I or shouldn't I uh, are much more inclined to, uh, you know, purchase and help spread the word as well. So, you know, we we were investing uh, in doing you know pop-up shops. We're doing more and more events in local communities uh, across the U.S. And um, you know, I think that will continue to be a really good way for us to build a brand and also to acquire customers. Yeah. I think it's also a great way to experiment with brick and mortar before you actually do it. So yeah, like I mean, you know, as the pop-up shop, especially yeah, yeah and the uh, events. And you know, I think Warby and uh, you know some of the other brands that have done these offline uh, or brick and mortar stores are more like guide shops than actual places where you can purchase things. So it's, it's more about them having you connect with the brand, and I think that's really, really important. Sure. Well, let's admit, Bonobos has a little help uh, there with Nordstrom's, um, but uh, Warby is very deliberate. Chris, you were mentioning earlier that you, um, that you were uh, targeting you know, brick and mortar stores. Yeah, the, the way we started Soulsy was we were going after brick and mortar stores in the beginning because we would walk into a boutique in, on Clement Street or Union Street, and they would be posting photos of items that they just got into stock, 
and people would come into the store looking to buy it, and they never thought about connecting the dots and actually selling that stuff directly to them on Facebook. And so we built Soulzy. And since then, we've actually focused primarily on people who are only doing Facebook. But we're now coming across stores that have um, multiple locations in, a, in an MSA. So one store we're working with has six locations right outside of Boston. And they never sold on Facebook before using Soulzy. And now they're, you know, they went from 1,000 fans to 21,000 fans. Their sales in-store are up 100%. And they went from $0 to $15,000 a week in sales, just selling directly to the community on Facebook. And what's interesting is when interviewing them and trying to understand why they were so successful, they said that it was the brick and mortar stores that is that why they believe they were so successful. People could return the items directly to the store. Um, if they had questions about items, they could go into the store and actually um, connect with the clothing and connect with a human being. And even though they would make the purchases on Facebook, um, being able to actually have that human connection was really important for them. So that actually changed the way I thought about brick and mortar stores. I would have, up until that point, advised our stores not to go that route. But now it makes a lot of sense. And what's also interesting is that sales are, like their lowest time of sales are like November and December, which is crazy in retail. But in store, it's their, 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 their peak. But January through March is their best time of year for sales on Facebook, which is the worst time in store. So it also smooths out their sales, which was really interesting. So. Wow, very interesting. Next question uh, is, I'll phrase it as an assertion, and we'll turn it into a question. Uh, online, brands have to work harder than brick and mortar retailers to create distinction and differentiation. You agree with that, and if so, how are you approaching this? So I, I agree with that. Um, I think online is a very you, you know, different experience. You don't get to make that emotional connection. like. Uh, Michelle was talking about, you don't get to walk by the uh, Victoria's Secret store and build that emotional connection. So um, you kind of have to come up with either a really great product or a really good value proposition or a brand that they really start to trust and believe in. So um, how you do that is, you know, I go back to our, you know, our topic about social is creating that engagement with that user on a regular basis. That consistent engagement is what really helps um, online businesses like ours either succeed or not. So, um, you, you know, again, social becomes a big piece of trying to be relevant in, in the user's mind. I mean, Michelle, how do you differentiate, um, and how do you create that uh, distinction so that you're not boiled down to a price equation? Yeah, uh, there was this dating site that used to say everyone is anonymous on the internet, um, and it sort of feels like that with as an e-commerce retailer. And I do remember when we launched, um, we actually launched at uh, you know another big technology conference talking about our algorithm and personal shopping and all that. But what really cut through the noise was a very clear and novel experience that had never been seen in an industry, in an industry, for lack of a better word, that you know needed to be disrupted. You know, had been the same for decades and decades, um, in part due to the industry structure and the dominance of certain players in there. And the very clear message was that novel experience, but value was still a really big part of it too. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I don't think that people necessarily think of online players only for the cheapest price now. Um, we've demonstrated that in our business. I'm sure you guys have as well. Um, but you know, there certainly is this expectation that as an e-commerce player, you're going to be delivering a better value of some sort. And in our particular case, you know, we had very clear taglines that we repeated over and over again on our website, in every single media briefing that we did, get fitted online in two minutes, no fitting rooms, no measuring tape, every bra, $45, done, get started. You know, And that was a really powerful statement because people were like, how is this possible? Mm -hmm. um, and that itself went viral, like on Twitter and on Facebook mm -hmm. and with the press itself. So I think you really, like, if you're going to, uh, do something that's completely online and you recognize that there are some uh, limitations to the online medium, that your message has to be cleaner, stronger, crisper, 
than it has to be if you just you know put up this great flagship store where you have so many other visual cues and various things to play with. Like you really only have one thing, which is whatever New York Times is going to write about you in a really short blurb. And so what is that message going to be? Um, so I think that's part of it. The other part of it is when people come to our site, we spend a lot of time thinking about our visual aesthetic. Um, and so we have actually recruited that way. We've had customers come to us that way. It establishes trust when you actually go to a site with a lot of polish that doesn't look like V1, but looks like V3. So people talk about design-centric e-commerce companies, and they do include us on the list uh, for that reason. Um, and that also goes a long way towards establishing the credibility and saying, yes, you can find what you were going to find at your local store here, but in the privacy of your own home, because we know what you're looking for is beauty in your life. You know, you're looking for a beautiful shopping experience. You're looking for beautiful bras. You're looking to feel beautiful once you put on the bra. Um, so kind of thinking through that as we, you know, design the website and how we photograph the products and all that kind of stuff, all of that helps as well. Sure, sure. So, uh, Sander, what about in, in, your, in your model, um, how, how important is brand differentiation and, and distinction? I mean, you're, you're trying to create a marketplace where consumers come, um, just like other retailers here, and, uh, and you have service suppliers that you're trying to match up. How important is that, uh, the brand aspect of differentiation uh, in your model? Uh, brand, brand is very important in local services. Brand, if you have a brand, it connotes trust, uh, and you need to trust local service professionals and the people that you hire them from. Um, our company is making a bet that you can uh, brand such a thing as local services. Um, Uber, you can imagine a brand around hiring local uh, drivers. Uh, exec, you can imagine a brand around hiring or home joy. You can imagine a brand around hiring house cleaners. But if a consumer hires a wedding photographer today and they need a math tutor tomorrow and a general contractor the next day, is it even possible to associate a single brand across all those different uh, professionals? Nobody's done it yet. Um, and so we're taking a bet that you can do it. Um, but it's it's very, very difficult thing to brand. We have uh, about eight minutes left, um, so I think we'll turn it over uh, to the audience and, uh, and take some questions. Who wants to invest in e-commerce? <laughs> All right. Yeah, it, it, I've actually invested in a few of you guys and through Funders Club, and one of the things I always struggle with with consumer internet and, and e-commerce is whether you should target uh, profitability in the near term or whether you should just keep driving ahead with spend trying to, to get users and that viral effect. Can you just talk about your thinking around that? So we think about that all the time. You know, should we continue to be profitable or should we just turn on the gas, throw fuel on the fire and just grow, grow, grow? So I think you know we're in that school of thought where we think it's important to have an eye on profitability. But I also think uh, when you're trying to do a marketplace, there's going to be one clear leader. You know? um, and it could be that if you grow slow enough because you're too concerned about profitability, you're attracting too many competitors. So I give the example of Groupon all the time when we talk about it internally. And you know, Groupon's a crappy business with not a whole lot of competition. I mean, with a lot of competition, but not a whole lot of defensibility. Uh, but they did a really great job of building that brand and capturing that market share. And you know, a number of other companies sprung up trying to do exactly that, very similar or better value proposition, and didn't do a really great job. Or, just didn't make it. Um, so I think, I think it's a little bit of a balancing act, not completely selling a dollar for 25 cents, but um, you know, keeping an eye out and making sure you're trying to be profitable, but you're also trying to grow at a pace that keeps you competitive and in the game. Our companies um, thought a lot about this over the years. We have gone back and forth repeatedly. 
between whether we're focusing on profitability or whether we're uh, taking big bets and throwing fuel on the file, fire, focusing on revenue. And frankly, it tracks our fundraising patterns perfectly. So <laughs> when we're about to fundraise, actually we uh, pull back from throwing fuel on the fire and try to get to profitability in case we can't fundraise. Um, and we don't want to fail and go under. So we try to get to profitability, then uh, we go to investors and we say, hey, we're looking to fundraise. We're almost profitable. Want to fund us? <laughs> Things are looking really good. And then, thankfully, we've gotten funded. And then we take the next you know, six, nine, 12 months, whatever, mm. take their money, throw fuel on the fire, take big swings, grow the company, hopefully, um, until we, again, need to swing back and focus on profitability. Pretty honest. <laughs> um, well, I would say, I think it depends on the type of e-commerce company. Like, I could completely see that in a marketplace, the value is scale. So you got to build, you got to pay to get scale, so you got to do it early. Um, in the case for us, we feel we're building a brand um, with our own products and with other people's products for, a, you know, a pretty unique kind of service. And my philosophy has been, at least in the first year, is, you know, what's our organic conversion rate if you didn't have to help the, or what's your organic conversion rate? What's your organic growth rate? Like without spending on anything, um, will customers actually find you naturally because they think you're that compelling of a problem? Um, and so fortunately for us, you know, bras are a big problem for every woman who wears a bra and there's a lot of women in the world. And so that worked out well for us and we were able to sustain ourselves over the first year at a pretty decent clip. You know, now, um, you know, in terms of profitability versus um, growth, I think unit economics profitability is really important. You know, trying to make sure you free up as much dollars as possible and understanding your customer lifetime value. And then it's all about testing and iteration. So, you know, we are putting down $5 bets on words, you know, right now to see how they do. And then we'll scale up to $100 bets and then $10,000 bets and then be ready for a $50,000 spend per month um, in, over some time frame. And we're going to have to do that again and again as we reach certain plateaus. Um, you know, in our customer base. Um, and so that's the approach that we're taking and I, I think it serves us quite well. That said, it's different for, um, for different e-commerce models. Excellent. Okay, that brings us to uh, right around 4.30. Uh, join me in thanking this panel. I think they've been really, really informative. Thank you guys uh, so much. Thank you.